you know, I, I joke all the time and say, I'm Batman, everybody else is Robin. But for the most time, I'm Robin and everybody else on my team is Batman because I shouldn't have hired you or partner with you unless you're smarter than me in certain areas. Um, but I, I have to reframe that because I, I say now, Robin was a little bit of a groupie. Anything Batman said, Robin was like, holy buttermilk, Batman. Holy Benedict Arnold. Holy hailstorm. Holy murder. I, I like more Captain Kirk and Spock because I'm running around crazy and Ted's my man. He'll He's like Spock. He will say, Listen, Cap. I don't think you should calm do that. Down. He, he, calm he, 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 calm down. down. And if I don't calm down, he's gonna pinch me on the neck, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go to sleep. Being an entrepreneur comes down to being a rebel, challenging the status quo, resisting conventional paths to success, and taking the road less traveled. But what does it mean to be a rebel? How do they think, act? How do they learn? And when did they realize they were doing their life's work? In this series, I sit down with inspiring entrepreneurs founders, and makers to hear their stories about building their business from the ground up. This is the life of a rebel. Hey everyone, uh, Harley here, back for another episode of The Life of a Rebel. And on today's episode, uh, I have the incredible pleasure and privilege of, of not only interviewing someone that has been a business mentor and advisor to me personally, but also to Shopify, but also someone that's been my friend um, for almost a decade. Damon John, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. It has been a decade. Wow. Time flies. It's crazy, right? But you know, one of the things that I, I want to start with, obviously, people famously know you for FUBU, of course, and and for you know being the star on Shark Tank, and frankly, for being this incredible engine of entrepreneurship and inspiring entrepreneurs around the world. But I actually want to go back, way back, even before FUBU. I want to ask a very simple question, but an important one that actually I don't know the answer to. What was the f- what was the first moment when you knew you wanted to be an entrepreneur? What, 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 did you have a first business when you were a kid? Hey, well, I didn't know it was entrepreneurship, you know, and uh, you know, and obviously, I, I grew up in a in an African American community where we didn't put a title to hustle or making extra money because um, we didn't know a lot of people that really kind of looked like us who had structured businesses. Even at that time, you got to remember there's only three stations out there, three networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And the only entrepreneurs that I saw that looked like me was Fred G. Sanford, the junk man, and he wasn't really doing that well. So, you know, I, I did little businesses as a kid and I would shovel snow and then I would, you know, rake leaves and do all those things. But my first real business that I tried to open and actually kind of, you know, create a structure around was buying crash cars at auctions and then, you know, trying to put them together and then sell them. You know, one of the things that you and I have talked a lot about over our years together is um, the influence and, and, the, and the roles both our respective mothers have played. You specifically often talk about your mother being a source of a lot of motivation and inspiration. Um, in my case, my mom and my, and my dad, for that matter, couldn't give me money, but they always, they made me business cards. I think I mentioned that to you a couple of years ago, that every silly business I had, uh, my parents would make me business cards saying, you know, Harley, CEO or founder of this company. And that gave me this great validation. So I'm so curious, like, was your mom, was your mother always supportive of your, of your endeavors in the early days, um, of food? I know that your mother actually took an ad out in the New York times. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. So my parents had got divorced and I, I would never see or speak to my father ever again after I was 10. My mother would start kind of doing what people are doing today with, uh, you know, Zoom calls. She would she would school me, but I didn't realize she was schooling me. And what she would do is because I was dyslexic or she knew I had a challenge reading, she said, well, I don't want you to read books with big words or whatever the case is. So here's what I want to do, Damon. I got to go to work and, you know, I got three jobs. I'm not going to be able to cook for you every night. So while I'm cooking and cleaning around the house, I need you to help me out because I need to know what's going on. In the world so she would give me the new york times and i would walk around reading her the new york times for hundreds of hours as you look at from age of 10 to about 16 years old and i didn't realize what she was doing and then you know as i started to do businesses and things of that nature she would you know um talk to me about structure not that she knew everything about structure but then she would say well i have a friend over here who's a real estate agent well i have this and that and you're gonna your mother's only gonna be able to take you so far um, your teachers have limited time in school, so you're either going to have to read these books or you're going to have to have people, uh, and I don't even know if we called them mentors back then, but, you know, she said, you were going to have to have your Mr. Miyagi's of the world. Wax on, wax off teach you some of these other areas and uh she taught me about the value of going and constantly seeking an education if it's not formal in some way or another and the fact that i had to have mentors and 
because uh, reading a book, I may not absorb all the information the right way at this time. She would say, go out and try exactly what the book says in your ways, because she knew that there was only two ways to learn in life through mentorship or through your mistakes. And she would push me out to do that. She would always, uh, you know, tell me dream bigger, you know, like, so when I did have the hats, I mean, I was happy enough with the hats, but she said, well, why aren't you doing t-shirts? And then I said, okay, well then maybe mom, we're going to get a store. She said, but if all these stores exist, why would you want the store? Why don't you sell to all the stores? So when you're sleeping and your head's on the pillow, the register is ringing on some store in another country. She's teaching you about wholesale right there. I mean, right. Exactly. And she, she, she would keep my mind expanding even till today. She still tests me. Um, and, you know, I may get off my shark tank, set my chest all out and stuff like that. And, um, you know, she'll question me and then she'll punish me and send me to my room. You know, most people obviously jump immediately to FUBU and this huge, successful brand business um, company that you had started. But, you know, one thing that you've told me over the years is that there were a couple failed attempts initially. Can you talk a bit about the first couple of attempts before FUBU became, you know, the brand that, that is so beloved and, and, and that everyone knows? You know, I think you and I have that thing in common, whether it's breakdancing or DJing and wanting to entertain people. And I grew up in Hollis, Queens, and, um, um, you know, so many amazing artists came from Hollis, Queens, Run DMC, LL Cool J, Salt and Pepper, 50 Cents, Ja Rule, uh, everybody, Onyx. And I wanted to be part of that community. Uh, when I was about 10 years old, uh, you know, uh, the, the clothing had to represent how hip hop was. So we had to tailor our pants so we can do windmills and breakdance or... Uh, put a permanent crease in your pant because if you wear, had a pair of red Levi's, by the time you iron them 20 times, the crease is not the same and it looked really raggedy. So my mother showed me how to sew a straight line. I failed at trying to be a rapper or a break dancer, but little did I know that that lesson my mother taught me at 10 years old on how to sew reflected when I said to myself in 1989 on Good Friday that I'm going to make a bunch of hats and go sell them on a corner. So at first I didn't have necessarily the financial intelligence. Um, the next thing is I started it up again, but I wasn't getting the fabrics at the right places. So I wasn't getting the right amount of resources uh, for my goods. And I had to close it again because I ran out of capital again. So the first time I figured out now a financial intelligence to some ex- some point, then I figured out distribution. Well, the next thing I needed was sales because I couldn't stand on the corner all the time. Um, and I closed it one more time after that because I didn't have sales. And then my three friends came around and said, we want to help you back in 1992. So I closed it three times from 89 to 92. And that's when it really started to take off because I had to understand that entrepreneurship is a team sport. And that you need many people around to help you during that. I want to talk a bit about your experience with some of the benefits or the disadvantages of of, of, of having business partners. And, and, you know, I've got a chance now to meet your entire team uh, at, at, at Shark Branding and in your all your hold codes. Team is a big part of your life. The people that you have in many ways, it sort of feels like you've you've assembled the Avengers around you. But talk to me about those early days of figuring out who your partners are and, 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 and maybe some, some, some lessons learned about working with friends. Yeah. So, um, went through a lot of friends as partners and not partners per se, you know, what I think what I learned earlier in life is that you have to have structure. You have to have an understanding about what are the deliverables for each person and that you should not jump into relationships. Uh, you know, there's a big O five. five, you know, whenever you see any of the FUBU product, there's this large, obnoxious O five five on it. And why we wanted to position ourselves a little different than other designers. We didn't want it to be just about us. We wanted to be a collective group of people that if all five of us agreed upon something, one of us was grungy, one of us was flossy, um, that, you know, everybody would probably uh, relate to something in there. But we went through 10 of that fifth member. There's 10 of the, there's 10 guys running around as the fifth beetle saying, by the way, I'm the fifth member of FUBU. Because they wouldn't stick around and they wouldn't stick around because in the early days we didn't have any money, but it was, okay, you're going to sweep up the factory for six months and then you're in a car, you're going to go to the stores and keep, you're going to hang out with all the rappers in the middle of the studio at night. Uh, I'm going to go to the video sets, whatever the case is. And, and we all work together, but you know, their, uh, their ownership and all of our ownership activated after we hit ser- uh, certain benchmarks and we would say, uh, if we hit this benchmark, your ownership activates. Oh, if we hit this benchmark or we don't hit this benchmark, we have to reconsider. We're going to close the business or we're going to change some form of operations. Also, another great part of it was, you know, there's been many times that I wanted to quit. Um, 
and uh, you know during the course of the probably the first six years, and they would not allow me, and and vice versa. But the hard part is, you know, the the friends and partners that I've had to let go because they didn't grow with the business, or they weren't ready to put in the time, or something in their life changed. You know, so many people talk about uh, as an entrepreneur, it's it's often said that you know to find something that needs fixing, a hole, a gap in the market, and to fill it. Did you feel that way about FUBU? Did you feel like there was something missing that the, the products you and your friends were wearing did not reflect who you actually were? Yeah, we, we felt that we felt that not only that is that even when we wore it, that the people that were taking our money were taking our money saying, we don't like you. We don't want you here. We do not want you wearing our clothes. So we felt we'll hurt. take your money, but we don't actually like like you. Right. Or want we you don't like wearing. you. You know, and, and it really happened. I mean, the, the breaking point, because I know a lot of those designers now and I know a lot of them were not stupid enough to say that about their customers. But you would also see that if we were wearing their products and you did not have us in any type of your advertising and marketing, well, then your the people that you were serving were not being reflected in when you in, in your advertising and marketing. But it took it a step further when the CEO of Timlin at the time, who's, you know, it's not the same company, has said, we don't sell or make our boots for drug dealers. But the end of the day you say you don't sell or make your boots for drug dealers not that i was a drug dealer but if you're only making it for construction workers why are you making kiwi and strawberry colored timblins and selling them in the middle of the hood i haven't i haven't seen too many construction workers wearing a pair of kiwi uh timblin but maybe i just haven't traveled enough you and i were uh giving uh giving a talk together to a group of entrepreneurs at one of the build a business competitions uh some of the winners and one of the things you talked about was in the early days when you were transitioning from hats to expanding the line to things like t-shirts, um, that you would go to these music video shoots and hand out t-shirts and get artists to wear them. I'm curious, you know, when you think about what it was like then walking onto set, um, sneaking in the back, you know, would it, would that be, is that possible today? Would that be, is that available today to an entrepreneur that's trying to build a brand in the way that it was? And maybe you can talk a bit about how you actually did that. Yeah, you know, I'm sure everything is just done on a different platform or done in a different way. The reason, the way that we did it is, again, growing up in Hollis, Queens, you know, we had access to all these artists and where their cousins and sisters and uncles live. So we would go to the sets. Now, most of the kids would get kicked off the set. And one of the reasons, to be honest, that we were doing FUBU as well was it gave us access to those sets. I would have paid to go and watch LL Cool J do Mama Said Knock You Out, you know, live for the first time mm -hmm. and being videoed and things like that. And um, and sometimes a lot of these sets were in our neighborhood because the guys came back home. So when LL Cool J shot Around the Way Girl or the one with Boys to Men, they came to the neighborhood. So there was also pressure, too, because now you have a lot of the neighborhood going, the FUBU guys are here. L, why aren't you wearing some FUBU, baby? And yeah, would, support, would, support our local entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So L, L would support us and stuff like that. So we had a high off of doing that. And also, a lot of times, people are always looking for inspiration. And, and traditionally, the music business and the fashion business have always been symbiotic. A lot of artists have come to us to say, what is my look for the next five years? And we have also looked at artists and said, wow, that looks cool as hell. We need to start doing some styles like that. So it was very symbiotic. And today, is there a way to do that? Yeah, of course. People are still shooting videos today. But, you know, are you going out after the more uh, uh, well-known um content people who are creating things for instagram stars or you know listen if you have a an amazing ladies apparel line there's a lot of photographers out there that are shooting influencers they need those those influencers need clothing to wear those photographers need great dramatic things work a deal i mean right. there's plenty as, of ways as opposed to, to trying to go to like the next kanye music video um yeah and that, that's it's it's funny because you know well you think of a brand like Fashion Nova and Richard from Fashion Nova, who has this incredible relationship um, with, with Cardi B. And a lot of I, I get this question all the time. People are like, well, you know, they can just throw money at it. That's not actually what happened. What actually happened was Richard eight years ago put a bet on a couple different artists and said, I believe these artists may blow up and Cardi B ended up blowing up. And so rather than trying to get Cardi now, he had built a relationship before anyone even knew she existed. And it sounds like you did this. You did a similar thing as well. 
Yeah, 100%. That's why I say you go to photographers and various other things. Because before I got to those video sets, you know what I did? I had 50 shirts and I made 55 X and 6X shirts. And I gave them to all the big guys because if I gave them to the artists at first who never understood the brand or a lot of the cool kids, well, they wore it once or twice and threw it away. But the 5X and 6X, I hate to break it to you, Harley, but they make black people big sometimes. <laughs> those 5X and 6X guys, they only had the choice of going to Rochester big and tall and getting a big white shirt or a black shirt, no design on it, or making it custom. So when I gave it to those guys, they wore it 15 times a month. Mm -hmm. And where were those guys? They were in front of the stages. They were in front of Red Ropes. They were in front of all the music artists. So I got the brand to be seen wow. by the music artists uh, without them knowing it. And sooner or later, the music artist said to me, hey, what am I, chopped liver? Right. And no, every, got, everywhere I look, everyone's wearing a FUBU shirt. It's sort of like these, it's like a mobile billboard in the most relevant places. Absolutely. And the big guys would say, Hey, man, all you guys are too cool, but I'm going to hook you up with little man, but you better <laughs> wear his shirt because if I find out that you don't wear his shirt, he ain't going to give me another shirt. That's right. All right? And that's, and that's how that works. I love that. One of the things that I, I've been studying a lot lately, and certainly from my purview at Shopify, is that entrepreneurship is far more accessible now. It feels like uh, more people can participate in this idea of small business. But I also uh, I have some concern of it, of it being overly glamorized that we, we begin to sort of tell the shiny stories of entrepreneurship when the truth is entrepreneurship is really, really difficult, whether it was when you were starting, uh, you know, FUBU or, or, or today. Um, but you, as the star of one of the most important, most impactful, frankly, one of the, the largest movements around entrepreneurship with Shark Tank. What do you, how do you reconcile that? How do you reconcile this idea that we want more people to be entrepreneurs, but let's also not get carried away that it's not an easy thing. If you want an easy life, entrepreneurship is probably not for you. Uh, I couldn't say it any better. You know, I talk about it all the time. I talk about the vulnerability that you need to have as an entrepreneur. The fact that, you know, you thank everybody for your success. You blame only one person for your failure. And the entrepreneur idea of you will get me coffee, you're hired, you're fired. It's, it's garbage, right? You, you got to be the first, you got to be the first to wake and the last to sleep and the last to get paid. Um, and I think that some of the problems are that, you know, Harley, you know, congratulations on what you and your partners have done. And, and, uh, you know, you will talk about a win called Shopify for the rest of your life. I'll talk about FUBU, uh, for the rest of my life. But the failures that we have, we go through, we go through them fast and we get over them and there's thousands of them. And that's why you generally only can hear, uh, not by design, but you hear about the successes because they keep moving on and they employ people and various other things. But all the failures that we have, you don't get to hear about. And and I try to take debunk that myth that it's so great. Um, and also, I want people to know that every Damon John and every Harley, you know, we need a Ted. We need a partner. We need, a, you know, being number two, three, four and five and ten of the company is extremely important. Yeah. You know, I, I joke all the time and say, I'm Batman, everybody else is Robin. But for the most time, I'm Robin and everybody else on my team is Batman because I shouldn't have hired you a partner with you unless you're smarter than me in certain areas. Um, but I, I have to reframe that because I, I say now, Robin was a little bit of a groupie. Anything Batman said, Robin was like, holy buttermilk, Batman. Holy Benedict Arnold. Holy hailstorm. Holy murder. I, I like more Captain Kirk and Spock because I'm running around crazy and Ted's my man. He'll he's like Spock. He will say, "Listen, Cap, I don't think you should calm do that." Down, he, he, calm he, he, calm down. down. And if I don't calm down, he's gonna pinch me on the neck and I'm gonna I'm gonna go to sleep. I'm right. gonna wake up and something else is done. Um, so, but so so I do agree totally with you. You know, um, everybody's showing people their sizzle reels and not their blooper reels, and you can get social media depression because every time you open up the you know, every time you open up social media, everybody's skinnier and sexier than you, and they're in Greece for some random reason. Um, and they're not showing you the <laughs> Everyone's failures. always in Greece, right? Doesn't make any sense. They're, I have no idea. All year round, there's no winter in Greece. When I know there's a winter in Greece, maybe those pictures are, uh, you know, from another time. Maybe you weren't even in Greece and you just put yourself in Greece. You know, you talked a bit about Ted and and and, uh, and, and sort of the people around you, the people that have been supporting you. I, I You know, one of the things that I've always admired and frankly that I've learned from you is the value of deep relationships. I think from the moment I met you, including, you know, including till now, I get a, I get a Damon Don, Damon John Christmas gift 
every single year. Uh, th- like like clockwork, come December, Damon John sends me something. Sometimes it's a picture of you that I get to put up in in my Damon John uh, you know shrine. But but <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> you, you, you you have done you have done something. Uh, you do, and you do this really, really well. Where you go so deep. I talk to my friends that from from Bombus, for example, who you're deeply involved with as well. And everyone kind of says the same thing, which is that Damon is far more than an investor and an advisor. He's he's our friend. Talk a little bit about how you've always viewed that, because your ability to take what could be a transactional business to business relationship and turn it into something more personal. It, it I mean, it, it's obvious. And, and whether it's things like, you know, the random text messages after an earnings call that you send to me, or it's the gifts that you send to so many people uh, for the holidays, there's something, there's something magical around the way that you marinate relationships. And I, I, I'm trying to do it a lot myself, but I think it'd be valuable for, for us to understand that a bit better and how you think about that. Yeah, I think I think first starting off, I'm an only child. Um, so I, I used to bring home anybody and everybody. Um, I you know I, a couple of times my mother would say, does Bill live here? I'd be like, no, he doesn't live here. She'd be like, well, how long has he been staying in your room? I don't know, three months. Where does he eat? <laughs> He's here. Oh, he lives here. Um, so I, 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 I'm somebody I think my only I think my true gift is that I value people and I know that uh, every relationship is like dating, and if we have a challenge in one way or another, it's one thing that we can we can work on together, and then we can find other ways to work together because nobody's perfect, especially myself. But I think that when you have a relationship, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. And so whether I'm creating hats and I and I say why should I stop at hats, and it could be it, this should be global. It's if I like a person, I trust the person. I see that morally we are on the same page collectively then i should be here for the person and we will find ways to make money or have fun or create change now it works another way as well you know every year at the beginning of the year i go i redo my goals and as as, as well as i um <clears throat> i look at people that i believe that i should alter our relationship or maybe cut out of my life because <clears throat> maybe they're just not a good friend to themselves. So they'll never be a good friend to me. And I may share with them how I've, I've given them what I felt as opportunities or the best, the best sides of me and they didn't appreciate it. And that I need to be able to let other people in my life who, who do appreciate me as well as that I can hopefully create change. And I think that they are going to be great people and great contributors to this planet. So you know, a lot of times, not just the, the sunny side, it, it, there's uh, tough decisions that we made. But I think, I mean, your friends are your, your inventory. That is, those those are people who are going to either influence you or they're going to keep you from progress. And I, and, and, and I dig deep into those that I feel are just good people. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for spending some time with me today. Thank you so much for being a part of Shopify's story. You know, as, as many people know, the entire idea of build a, the Build a Business competition, which became one of the largest competitions on the planet for entrepreneurship, you really were an architect of it, and you helped bring it to the mainstream and make entrepreneurship more accessible. On a personal level, th- thank you for being my friend and, and my mentor and an advisor for so long. I, I feel very lucky to be on that Christmas card list, that Christmas <laughs> gift list. But I also feel very lucky to have you in my life and, and I'm grateful for you spending some time with me today. Well, I'm very, I'm very proud of you and I'm, I'm glad how you are fighting the good fight for entrepreneurs. And like, like the great questions you asked, you know, let's take some of the gloss off of it and let's roll up our sleeves and get to work. You know, you're an inspiration. So I definitely appreciate everything. Thanks, man.